Hi guys, how are you? Mind this one, Titanium. Welcome back to Real Macroeconomics and Investing, patreon.com slash real macro. Don't forget to come down and subscribe. Uh, don't, you know, 66 cents a day. <laughs> All right, okay. So, why are we screwed? That's going to be uh, uh, the video topic. Uh, and we're going to go back in time, and we're going to start to uh, understand better, hopefully better, uh, how economics works, right? So there's this belief that if we, you know, increase the amount of dollars uh, in, in circulation, that those dollars are going to enter the local economy, and then that's going to create demand, and then that demand is going to hire people, and then, we, you know, the increased spending is going to create more dollars, via lending and then there's going to be more dollars in the economy and it's going to be the economic multiplier okay but the reality of the situation is that's not how it works <laughs> unfortunately i've shown this chart many times but uh what you're going to see is that you know in the 70s going all the way up to the 80s uh we had more gdp growth than public debt and the economy kept growing well since then what's happened is that you're getting less and less and less and less and less and less and less GDP growth with every new dollar, dollar that is created. And this is only public. Huh? There's a lot more to this than just public because you've got to create money from banks as well. So does it work? Does it, does it work that you're going to stimulate demand and grow the economy just because you printed money? No. It doesn't work and this is as simple as i can make it for you right there's not a, one dollar of money creation does not create one dollar of gdp and in the way they make it sound is that the money multi, the the money multiplier effect should create more than one gdp uh for every new dollar that is created and in fact we know that is false it's actually the opposite now, if you go back in time and you, you look at the debt to GDP, okay, and this is private debt, private debt, right? You're going to see that private debt is 220% of GDP. Now, the public debt doesn't necessarily matter, matter uh, that, it, that it grows, except for the fact that when the public debt is not growing, and then, I'm sorry, when the private debt is not growing sufficiently, and the public that has to step in to offset it during the good times. I'm not talking about bad times. During the good times to offset it, to try to keep the economy going, you're in trouble. And again, we come back to the same thing, that if you're going to borrow money, right, and you're going to invest that money, then that should grow the economy, right? It should grow GDP. So it shouldn't be 220% of GDP, but it is. Okay, so that's that's the problem. So you have public and private that cannot boost gross domestic product, cannot boost uh, in, in the same speed as money is being created. So what ends up happening is you keep lowering and lowering and lowering and lowering interest rates so you can get more and more private debt into the system so you can keep the growth going. But what ends up happening is there's slippage. There's more money being created than GDP. And, uh, you know, again, this chart here is from 2019. So God knows what it is today, right, in 2020. Now, when you think about spending, right, one person spends, it's another person's income and so forth, right? And that's the way, that's the economy. And the cumulative amount of the entire buy and sell, buy and sell is GDP. So when you, when you think about, what does it take to consume? Well, first you need some income. Now, this can come from government, right? Free money. Or it can come from a paycheck, right? Either way, it doesn't matter, right? You need some kind of income so you can go out and consume. Now, you can also use debt to consume, right? And that debt is promising that you're going to pay that money back in the future, plus interest, right? So whatever you're going to earn in the future you're going to pay that uh, amount uh, in interest, a portion of that in interest. Now, if, if the debt levels get too high, well, what happens? You either stop using it prior to reaching the limit or 
it reaches a limit and then you know you can't borrow anymore but as long as you can sustain the minimum monthly payment you know you're solvent everything is good so that takes away from your paycheck so when you're paying down uh when you're sustaining debt right uh so that leaves you with less money to go out and consume so when you hit that brick wall right consumption starts to suffer and what the government can do is increase you know uh money helicopter money like it's doing now it can lower interest rates which you can't do anymore it can qe and give uh bondholders cash instead of bonds but they're savers bondholders are not spenders and hope to god that they go out and spend well, that doesn't work so when you start hitting a recession and you know 70 percent of gdp is consumption and that consumption starts to drop well somebody's got to make up that drop right somebody has to step in and spend so the idea is that the the money the uh, economic multiplier is if you add dollars okay that you're going to go out and you're going to spend those dollars it's going to make up the difference and then you're going to create more gdp and then uh consumption will rise right back up to 70 percent and then that 70 percent is going to create jobs and so forth as as we talked about well let's take a look at what it looks like today let's take a look at what's going on today this is u.s employment to population ratio we are at 57.64 and 2000 were as high as about 64 65 percent and ever since right 2000 and what is that six and then that was down to 63.5 uh, and then just prior to this recession we were down to about 61.5 and now we're down to 57.4 so we have a declining uh, population force, right? Uh, workforce pop, uh, to population ratio, right? Sorry, I'm a little bit tired. Um, so where are you going to find the people to, to, to give them a job, right? It's a problem. It's a problem to get that GDP back up because that means that 57 point, uh, whatever it is, 4% have to make up the consumption for the previous uh, levels of uh, employment, right? All these previous levels, they have to make up for it to keep the growth going. Otherwise, you're going to start to contract. So that's problematic. When you have your debt, that is starting to be maxed out. Now, what about the other people that are not in the, in the, in the workforce, that are not working? Well, they don't have an income unless it's coming from the government, which is helicopter money right now. Okay. The debt, if it's not already maxed out, it's going to start getting maxed out at some point. All right. And then they're going to have to start tapping into their savings to consume. And they're not going to consume discretionary, you know, uh, things they like. All right. So they're going to go on vacation. They're not going to go out and buy an iPhone. Okay. So that's problematic. When the savings is tapped out, when the savings tapped out, then they're going to start liquefying 401ks, borrowing against their home, right? They're going to start liquefying their hard assets, their soft assets, whatever, right? So then you're at stage four. This is the last, this is the last, that's it. After this, you know, there's nothing else you can spend. And, you know, when that starts to occur, and you saw that in Europe, you saw that in Greece, where people didn't have jobs, they started to sell their their uh, real estate uh, in the village or whatever the case uh, may be. They started selling their stocks, they started selling everything, and then you start going into a deflationary spiral. So my problem is, from my perspective, you cannot maintain the 70% of GDP consumption. Not with so few people working. Okay. Even if it starts to, to pump up, remember that you got to maintain a high level of consumption in order to create jobs. And even when we were 3.4% unemployment, right, that's just, the, that's just the rate. When you look at the uh, U.S. employment population ratio, we've actually been declining. A lot of that has to do with baby boomers, whatever the case may be. 
So things to start, you know, that are warning signs, things to start to worry about when they start to occur is, you know, if, if individuals have too much private debt like housing, the total private debt, the sudden increase of total private debt, and the private and public debt combined, when these things start to spike, okay, you, you got to start worrying. Something is really fundamentally wrong. To make matters worse is when, if you were to divide consumption, okay, and because this person is not going to spend, all right, you're, you're spending your money buying shit from Amazon. And Amazon takes those dollars out of circulation by profit savings, right? This is just an example. It's not going to the mom and pop store that's going to go out and spend it back into the economy, you know, and then start all over again. Okay, so when you start having that profit savings problem where the household is saves and then there's a profit savings on the other end, well, what happens is you start getting drainage from the productive economy, right? So you have this stupid idea, which well, I don't know if it's stupid, but it probably worked back then, right? But you have this, you know, uh, this theory of a equation of exchange where the money times velocity equals price times transaction, right? It's GDP in the aggregate. And that's the, that's the way it's supposed to work in theory. So you hear about people saying, oh, the broad money and M1 and M2 and blah, blah, blah. And other, but it's bullshit. It doesn't work because velocity is not there. Why isn't there a velocity? Because that money is being sucked out of the productive economy into profit savings. And that is what causes asset price inflation, right? Stocks, bonds, and so forth. Right? They, they go up exponentially. So again, you know, when the government deficit spends into the productive economy, right, it goes through the household income to savings, and then it goes into profit savings, right, to these large corporations. And then they suck money out because they're not going to spend it. They're net savers, right? And then it goes into stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, and so forth. And that's exactly what we've been observing. It's the same thing when you export, right? When you export, those dollars go to overseas accounts. So when I'm saying export dollars is what I'm talking about, right? When you're importing, you're exporting dollars, right? So where do those dollars go? Well, those dollars, and I haven't made a video about it, but I guess this is going to it's gonna be good enough for now. Where it's going to go, it's going to go to China, right? It's going to go to Europe. It's going to go to Mexico, Japan, Germany, right? These are... These are the countries that we import from the most. So you, you end up with a, you know, worldwide, it's about 800 billion right now is what we are exporting to the rest of the world. Well, that's a drain from the, that's a drain from the productive economy. So you're getting money sucked out from profit savings. You get uh, imports that are sucking out money from the productive economy because you're exporting those dollars to the rest of the world, and you end up in a very bad situation. You can't get that inflation going because you can't keep sufficient amount of money in the productive economy. And if you can't keep that money in productive economy, velocity is going to suffer because there's always going to be a drainage. Now, if you go back and, and take a look at exports and imports, what you're going to see is that um, imports started to drop off before exports right and that that started to concern me and i'm like mm, that's interesting you know imports are starting to to fall off and what usually happens before a recession is that the the, the trade balance starts to to shrink and usually it shrinks because the economy is not doing as well usually now this time around you know we could have made an argument about fracking or something to that effect that you know, now we're a net uh, exporter of oil instead of being an importer. So it was a little bit funky. But n nonetheless, I, I was a little bit concerned about that because I'm like, okay, well, why is this thing starting to turn up uh, and we're importing less? Which is not necessarily a bad thing. Is it because of trade wars? Is it because of fracking? Is it, you know, you, you, you can't tell because there's so many moving parts. And here you can see it right in here. And this is what I kept talking about. I'm like... And again, this is back in October 2019 and November and so forth. I'm like, you know, this thing turning back up, which is usually what happens in a recession. You can see it every single time, right? There's another one, right? It starts to shrink down and then it starts to increase. I'm like, mm, you know, 
are we in a recession already <laughs> what's going on here and sure enough you know of course COVID made it a lot worse but we were going into a recession if not we were slightly in a recession uh and then everything just fucking exploded right from there so not only did we suffer a a, a job loss right of people working massive job loss and we've been declining now for quite a long time not only are we maxed out on our credit not on, on top of all these problems that we have we're importing more than we're exporting which means that we are sucking more more dollars out of the productive economy okay if that wasn't enough so, so now somehow we have to figure out how we're going to start exporting more how we're going to get more people back to to, to work with high, very high debt levels so how are we going to get that consumption up so we know we've printed about 3.1 trillion and if you add the uh, the social security benefits whatever that's another trillion there so it's about four trillion look what happened into asset prices look what happened these are the uh, inflows of cash into u.s equities international equities fixed income which is bonds right international fixed income commodities currencies leveraged inverse right look at that look at that up 8.54 percent so do you see now what i'm saying that profit savings equals asset price inflation right this money should be in the productive economy to create jobs to to restart the economy instead they're going into stocks and bonds it's 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 fucking insane right now if that's not enough if that's if that's not bad enough look at all the money the lending facilities that we you know cares act who the fuck are we caring for <laughs> the, the cares act okay so who's the cares act the the uh, corporate credit right secondary market corporate credit facility Manip, man, uh, man, <laughs> municipal uh liquid facility all right here's one this is ours main street lending program okay that's good uh back security loans asset back security loans commercial paper right money market mutual fund liquidity facility primary dealer right that's the cares act and then we have the paycheck protection program liquidity right for the airlines so this is the carers act right so we 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 pump these monies all over the uh the economy and then what what happened what happened right we we have the stimulus in place we're bailing out everybody and their mom we're pumping money into the stock market and we get what uh unemployment claims are starting to rise again with stimulus with stimulus now remember remember what they told you they told you that if you go out right and you print money you're going to add additional money and then those dollars are going to go to the local economy it's going to create demand and then they're going to hire people increase spending that's what they told you is that happening not even close well what about this uh you know uh, uh equation of exchange right money times velocity equals price times uh, uh transactions gdp right it's going to start growing well is it growing <laughs> not even close so we're going right back into a recession and while we're in a recession this is why I've been calling this since, since the beginning a depression because that's what it is it's a depression now remember that the Fed has a dual mandate right that, that all it can do is you know price stability and max employment <laughs> right that's it Mac, and that it does that by just manipulating interest rates what else does it do because it's not a dual mandate anymore right now now it's the lender of last resort right so we go out we give money to Boeing we give money to everybody and their mom right Let, let's take a look at that real quick where is that okay so corporate bond frenzy everybody's issuing fucking bonds 
All right, so they got all this this money, and do you think that McDonald's needs 6.5 billion, and uh, T-Mobile needs 4 billion, Nike needs 6 billion, all right? You think they need all that shit? Apple needs 8.5 billion. Why? Why is Apple raising? They got so much cash, they don't even know what to do with. All right, so they're buying these junk bonds. So uh, remember repos, right? Repos, lender of last resort. Banks were not lending to each other. Oh, don't worry about it. It's just a short-term thing. It's not QE. Remember that? All right? So their price stability, which they suck at. Uh, well, I guess they don't suck, but they just can't control, you know, inflation. Uh, max employment. Lender of last resorts. Right? They opened up the swap swap windows to all the major central banks. Whoever needed dollars went out and got as many dollars as they needed. We got that money back now, thank God. Uh, and, you know, they're supposed to regulate banks. They suck at fucking doing that shit, right? Uh, so we end up with what? Income inequality at historic levels. How wonderful. And on top of that, it's got all these lending, you know, programs that we talked about, and that's going to be forgiven, and they're going to use SPVs from treasury so they can facilitate that because the the fed in of itself cannot print money okay it can exchange bonds for for dollars but it cannot print money all right and all of that is creating net inflows to all of these uh asset classes right aum by the way is um, uh, assets under management all right and that just keeps growing and growing and growing <laughs> while less and less people are working and we're sitting here you know helicopter money call me crazy but to me it looks like the fucking wheels came off <laughs> i swear to god everything is just completely fucking ass backwards everything is fucked up uh <laughs> less and less people are working maxed out credit deficit spending like there's no tomorrow uh importing out of our ass right exporting dollars to the rest of the world all the money that is supposed to go to the productive economy grow the economy is going to fucking stocks creating a wealth effect right and uh 2003 i guess that we're trying to use uh, housing has that feel good oh you know we're going back to normal now they're using stocks to do the same thing oh i feel like i'm rich because my 401k if i have one is going higher higher therefore i feel good about myself I mean, uh, you know, give me a fucking break. So what's the dollar doing? Well, the dollar's going down. Yeah, Nick, but look at the, you know, it's done this before in 2018. You know, it just goes up and down. Don't don't worry about it. Is this anything like 2018? Is it? Uh, I don't I don't think so. All right? The dollar has been going down for quite a while. It's not like this is uh, this is just like a, you know, sideways kind of move. Right, it's been going down since uh, 1986, and I don't want to sound like an Austrian or a Peter Schiff. All oh, the dollars lost 95% of its value, blah blah blah. Yeah, but wages have have risen, right? Um, you know, it's a very good counter ar argument. It's a very good counter argument. The problem with that counter argument is that GDP has not grown uh, in the same way. See, if GDP was growing a proportion, I don't have a problem with that. But it's not. It's not. And that's problematic. So if you're exporting dollars to the rest of the world, if you open up your swap window to everybody and your mom, is there going to be a demand for the dollar? No, because everybody has sufficient amount of dollars. But you're sacrificing the productive economy. See, in the beginning... In the beginning of the crisis, prior to the crisis, you know, well, you know, it's a, it's a position of strength that we can import because we're so rich and we have 3.4% unemployment. And it's true, right, that your economy is so great, it's so strong that you can maintain max employment plus import some more and create jobs for the rest of the world. That's true. But what about now? What about now? Right? We need those fucking jobs. So we need to export. But how are you going to export when you're when you're so expensive? How are you going to be as productive from when you had 64% of the population working and now you only have 57? 
right? Why would you want to buy that economy? Warren Mosler, oh, you know, imports are a benefit, exports are at a cost. Really? Having jobs for people is a cost? Because remember, if you're producing and you're exporting, you're acquiring other people's money, right? Those, those dollars come, or whatever they are, they come to the United States, and then they make that... Uh, um, the velocity of money work because it goes into the productive economy. People actually have jobs. So we found ourselves in a very bad situation where we print, we import, right, and and borrow. And we can't even borrow anymore. We're stuck at 220, 220% of GDP. So what are we witnessing now? High unemployment. Yeah, but you don't look at it, it's only 6.9%. Forget about that 6.9%. I said that before. You got to look at the long-term unemployment, which is rising. Here it is again, right? You see the unemployment rate is coming down, but look at the long-term unemployment. It's rising. Okay. So don't look at that 6.9 and be like, oh, look, it's wonderful. No. Look at the other side. Look at the other side. Look at the long-term long -term unemployment. Even when you look at the at the stock market versus the dollar, what you'll see is that the stock market is rising and then the dollar is falling, right? So you're not really getting the full effect, the benefit of, of, of the S&P going up, right? It's, it's, that's not even fucking working right. Look at rentals in New York, okay? From $3,500 down to almost $2,500 in six months. Well, it's the lockdowns. Well, fuck, we've been open since May. You know, and if you call that a lockdown, that wasn't a lockdown. That was a partial lockdown. That's not a real lockdown. But even so, even so, it doesn't matter. Right? So where, where's all the... <laughs> we've been open. Where's all this economic growth from the velocity of money and the velocity of, you know, the economy of additional dollars in the system? You're going right back into a recession. In a recession. With stimulus. What are you going to do without it? It now takes 120 hours of work to buy one stock, I'm sorry, one share of the S&P 500, okay? 120 hours for the average person to buy one share of the S&P 500. So again, you look, you know, we added 4.234 trillion. Corporate profits are all-time highs and employment pop, uh, Population ratio is down of whatever it is, 57.4. Yep, everything is fucking beautiful. Let me look outside my door. Uh, let me see. Yeah, everything looks normal. Yeah, <laughs> America, let me show you my arm. Winning, we're winning. <laughs> right, Logan? What a fucking clown that guy is. <laughs> Uh, everything looks fine. America is the greatest in 1776. <laughs> right? The little retards. People that don't know shit. People that can't even recognize what is going on in the real economy. And they're just running around. Yeah, America is great since 1776. I have a fixed point model. I have a fixed point model. Buy the dip. Yeah, okay, you buy the dip. So... Let's talk about vaccines, and then we'll close it out. Uh, actually, we'll do a little bit of the, uh, the market open. All right, so when will the va vaccine be here? Well, we know when it is. It's today, right? Uh, what is the effectiveness? We don't know yet. Um, the bad thing about it is that it just prevents severe sickness, from what we understand, in 90% of the people. Um, so that's the effectiveness. So... For right now, we assume that even though you may not get sick from it, you can still spread it to other people. That's not good. That's not good. Right? Uh, the quantities, they're hoping to get 20 million out by April. Yeah, but we're 330 million Americans. And if we assume, let's say, we know it's 15 million that are infected. Let's say it's 30 minute million instead of 15, whatever. Uh, we need to get to 240 million uh, before, or 70 percent, 75 percent, in order for the vaccine to, you know, to have any meaningful impact in the uh, uh, in, in society. Now, you can't give the the vaccine to 
kids under the age of 18 yet. So that's going to make it more difficult. You got a bunch of Trump pods running around. You can't force me to take the vaccine. It's going to make me autistic. You're already fucking autistic if you, if you can't figure out that you need to take the vaccine. Because sitting here saying that, well, you know, uh, the leak is on your side of the boat. Well, guess what? We're going to drown because you are on the same boat I am. And the fact that the leak is on my side of the boat doesn't make your life any better. All right? You're still screwed. So if you don't do what you have to do, then, you know, that's problematic. So you end up with these Trump bots with Trump not conceding and leading, you know, the army of morons uh, that's going to create, you know, a, a shadow president, if you will, uh, in the economy. And that's going to that's that's setting up for social unrest with such high unemployment, long term unemployment. And then you got this this moron Trump. Uh, trying to be president from the shadows and people are not going to listen to you know what Biden says put the mask on take the vaccines blah 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 how are you going to get to 40 to 70 uh, percent or 240 million uh, vaccinated it's going to be very difficult all right so is there going to be a mutation we don't know that how many dosages well we know that now it's two you need two dosages so even if you get 100 million uh, dosages, well, that's only for 50 million people. Uh, how long will immunity last? We don't know. Uh, what are the side effects? Well, there's been some reports here and there. That, you know, you're going to get some wild answers. Until people start taking it, you know, you're not going to really know. And that's, again, that's going to be, uh, uh, let's say one person dies and then everybody stops taking it, that, that's going to be a problem. Because it may not be from the vaccine, but people are going to perceive that it is. And especially the Trump bots are really not going to take it. Forget about those guys. Uh, you know, maybe there's a, a hiccup in, in distribution or something happens, right? And then you end up in a, in a very bad situation. That's, so that's why I always say, you know, just because you got a vaccine doesn't mean we're going back to normal anytime soon, right? There's a, the, the expectations are so high that we're going to go back to normal that any kind of hiccup is going to screw the markets up. Uh, how many people are willing to take it? We talked about that, right? Uh, will we need booster shots? We don't know yet. So from my perspective, what's going on right now is that you have the dollar that's falling, right? We're trying to stimulate exports. The economy is not doing so good, so people don't want to buy dollars, okay? Um, our import, imports are certainly providing the world with sufficient amount of dollars, so that's not an issue. But that's not going to create demand for the dollar. Interest rates for now are rising, trying to compensate, okay, so they, they, they can create some kind of demand for the dollar. We'll see how long that lasts. But remember that everybody else is more or less in the same, same boat, right, with the exception of Asia. So Europe also needs to devalue their currency because they want to, you know, create unemployment and, and support their exports. So you end up in some kind of a currency war now, right? Uh, you're going to end up in a very bad situation because you already have a private debt problem. You already have uh, a, a weak public finance problem uh, that's going to start to, re to resolve. You're going to have low growth, if not stagnation high unemployment right weak banks as we we go into that negative interest rate uh, world uh, you know everybody's trying to devalue the currency at the same time uh, that that's a recipe for disaster so what comes after after trying to devalue your currency well protectionism right tariffs and this and that and that doesn't that's never worked out so i don't know to me it looks like a big shit show and I don't regret one second not being a bull. Not for a second. I, I, I much rather, you know, err on the, in, in the side of caution than sit here and try to be this dumb fuck. That, I'm buying the stocks. I'm buying stocks. They're going up. I'm buying stocks. Uh, no, nah, that's for somebody else. That's not for me, man. All right. So uh, let's take a look at what is going on since the market opened. All right, opened up in the morning, a little bit up uh, this, mo this morning for Asia. 
uh, nighttime for us here in uh, uh, the U.S. So nice pop, right? Gapped up. Now let's see where this wave ends. It's, it hasn't hooked yet. Right? There hasn't been a hook. But what it's done so far is more or less tested the previous high with a lower high. Right? This is gray because we're not really um, validating this structure yet. It is a flat one, two, three. So price is consolidating at the bottom of this trend line here. Let's see if it holds for one more up. Okay, if it breaks out here. Uh, otherwise, this is bearish. You have the, the compass. Okay, this is the compass, the one, move wave, wave one down, builds pressure at the bottom of the structure, and then it falls apart. So the first point I would guess is about 12,000, which is the point of control since the previous high where it might bounce from. Okay, so you'll get something like this, and then you can draw a nice little line, right? And then you can get one more up from here. And if that gives away, that starts to give away, then the next point is going to be down here around 11, uh, 450, 11, 500. Okay, so then it will start to correct. And then it'll come to this support area here. Okay, and then we'll start looking for one more up. So long as it remains within this structure here, right, the bias to the upside, uh, you want to short the top and buy the bottom. That's the way you want to approach that. Alternatively, this is a double top right in here okay so if price starts to consolidate at the bottom here okay something like this then you look for a bigger down move right but we're not there yet we're not there yet all we're worried about now is this little structure right in here building pressure at the bottom of this um, channel might might be a little bit uh, might be a little bit uh, noisy for you right now but it's a one two three and now it's building pressure here so for the next move down Okay, that's the way I'm looking at it. S&P 500 looks a little bit better, but it's in the middle of nowhere uh, between these two structures here. Okay, so you got a one, two, three. It's valid so long as it remains within a structure. The bias is to the upside, but you really want to, again, you want to buy, buy the, the bottom part, and then you want to sell the top, and then buy the bottom, right? Because this can last for, for a while, all right? So that's that's that, and small caps pushing higher. This I would I would probably say is probably the most bullish. It's kind of like high basing at the top of the channel of the wedge. Okay, so that's kind of bullish to be honest with you. All right, uh, let's see if this breaks out. If it does, you know, it's, God knows how how much this is going to run. Uh, Bitcoin had a nice little move up back to that 19,000 level and what it looks like is happening here is that it's correcting through time rather than price so look for something to something like this okay that's that's kind of like a high base and then at some point it'll push will push higher again uh, so uh, I was surprised it didn't come down and test even the previous low so again this is starting to look bullish now as a high base uh, so keep that in mind uh, us dollar japan doing nothing euro usd is building a nice little bull bull flag okay now this violates price here a little bit right but i'm not too worried about it uh it looks like a nice little high base here as well Okay, so high base and then boom, one more up. So that's good uh, if you're a, you're a bull. Uh, the pound, you had some puckery move last week, but we're still in that range that we're expecting that the pound will eventually take off. This is going to take off, all right? It's tested it once, twice, three times, four times, five times, eventually this inverse head and shoulder is going to go uh, what else uh, usd cad continues to go lower uh, australian dollar kicks ass all over the place new zealand dollar kicking ass all over the place and i've said this 
you want to buy this, you want to hold it, you know, just let it do its thing. Little balance in US dollar peso, and then dollar one uh, continues to devalue, all right? Now, I think that it's in the Chinese interest to allow their currency to appreciate a little bit. Uh, their trade exports are doing really good. Uh, you want the U.S. to recover because they're going to continue to import from you as as uh, as more and more people get a job. So, um, you know, I wouldn't look for China to step in and try to devalue their currency. It's not in their interest to do so, okay, at this point. Uh, the 10-year still hovering around here at that 0.9, right? So we'll see how this behaves tomorrow morning. Uh, other than that, um, let's see how, you know, how tomorrow opens, okay? The, there's no news that is, you know, wow, other than, hey, we're going to give you $900 billion. Okay, that's great. We knew that was coming. Uh, the, what else? Uh, there's some social unrest. I don't like it. There was some hacking. I don't like that either. Okay. Um, according to the, you know, and this is why you don't fire the head of the cybersecurity. You don't do that. You don't just fire him because he, he didn't tell you the answer that you wanted. You know, how, how long has it been? 10 days a guy got fired? And boom, immediately, we got fucking hacked. Uh, I guess it was the Commerce Department and Treasury has been hacked. So that's not good. And according to that guy, whatever his name is, Kemp, uh, apparently it was a pretty big hack. Uh, it, w it was pretty noticeable. Of course, they're always going to blame the, the Russians, of course. Uh, but we don't know who did it. <clears throat> we'll never know. It's not our job to know. But again, when you go into these transition from one president to the other, then the one president is not behaving properly and is acting stupid. Uh, bad things happen, you know. We are we're vulnerable right now, and we're going to be so for a while, uh, at least the beginning parts of uh, the Biden administration. We're, we're trying to get this transition thing going. We're divided. We have a shadow president. We're, we're, we're in fucked up situation. And again, I think that's that's problematic. All right. So that's it for this video. Uh, not much more to talk about. Again, to me, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But you know, this multiplier uh, effect bullshit doesn't work. I'm sorry to tell you. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye bye.